I think what we've been talking about so far is the uh, soundness of our uh, economic policies and a little bit of consistency. You've seen that over the years um, we have established that track record. But uh, there was also another issue about uh, predictability. I'm not yet, uh, you know, you know I, I've not yet come to this, so um, I'll come to that later. But um, just about predictability. Again, that predictability is very important, uh, especially for uh, the, the private sector, because um, many businesses rely on a predictable uh, policy environment. If the policy environment is not predictable, then uh, uh, it becomes very difficult to uh, make strategic decisions and uh, plans, investment plans and uh, other business plans. So, for example, if uh, inflation is not stable, it becomes very difficult for, uh, because that's a major variable in most of the, uh, in making business uh, plans and decisions. The exchange rate, you talk about what happened in uh, 2011, uh, again, if you don't have predictability of the exchange rate, it can really destabilize businesses. Interest rates, if you cannot um, have a stable and predictable interest rates, uh, it becomes uh, very difficult. Now, overall, in, uh, in terms of macro management, one of the key drivers of instability, especially in uh, countries like ours, is, the, is fiscal policy or the budget. If you have a borrow, you crowd out uh, private investment because the government competes with private sector in, a, in, a, in the credit market and that has a tendency to raise interest rates uh, and maybe even inflation. So uh, it's very important for businesses to know uh, what interest rate will be. Uh, and for that reason, in uh, uh, managing our fiscal policy becomes very critical. One thing we, we like to make sure we do is to borrow what we have said we are going to borrow from the market. Unless we see that uh, um, there is more liquidity than, uh, than uh, we expected. We would not want to borrow more than uh, we said we would borrow because we want to send that signal of uh, predictability. And uh, some time ago, uh, before 2003, we used to get into trouble with, uh, say, for example, uh, we expect some money from donors. We have factored it in our budget. If we don't get it, because we have already formed a budget which has been passed by parliament, we have to borrow domestically to, um, to be able to fill that uh, gap that uh, is left with the donors. So uh, that happened to us, especially in 2003 and 2004, when um, I remember there was a lot of interest after the elections of 2002, and a lot of donors came and pledged up to $3 billion. And we thought, this is good. Uh, we factored in the budget. Of course, not all of it, because it was going to be for uh, about three years. And uh, somehow, the donor community turned out to be just making promises, empty promises. We didn't get the money, and uh, it was a major destabilizing factor in, um, in that particular year, 2003 and 2004. So what we did after that is to make a major policy decision that no donor money is going to be factored in the budget uh, because if you do that and you don't get it, it is going to destabilize your borrowing plan and that will affect interest rates and uh, it will, uh, also banks that buy treasury bills and other institutions that buy treasury bills and bonds, they, they, their plans get completely out of line with w what is happening uh, because of instabilities like that. So we made a conscious decision that we are not going to factor any donor money in our budget. At the same time, we decided that we can collect our own uh, revenue, mobilize our own revenue uh, domestically, and uh, what I can tell you, uh, that is when Kenya committed to ensure that we don't also depend on donors, again to reduce that instability. Some countries like Rwanda depend on uh, donors in their budget, it's about 40% funded by donors. Even Uganda is a huge chunk. 
So when you don't get donor money, it becomes a major destabilizing factor and you lose pred uh, predictability. Uh, so as a strategy, that's what we did. Mobilize your own resources, do everything to improve tax administration, make it easier for people to pay, and then show them the results of that uh, um, tax, what it's doing. And I think um, you agree with me that everywhere you go, you find new roads, you find um, a lot of other investments in, um, you know, in terms of infrastructure, uh, education, uh, health, Although some of those institutions are st still need some uh, some work before they they the you know they 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 can be considered to be doing um, performing well. So um, the other factors that uh, come into play also to ensure that we we have predictability in terms of uh, our budget. And what I mean here is uh, ensuring that we don't over borrow or uh, yeah, because that, as I said, will destabilize. Uh, the economy. For example, we have had uh, wage demands by various sectors, health workers, teachers, name it, doctors, police, uh, and those are demands that were not budgeted for. For many countries, we'll probably go to the market and borrow more, but what we do is to rationalize our budget, ensure that you take those expenditures from other areas that, that perhaps were priority, but now because some of these are political decisions, you finance them that way. But the overall idea is to ensure that your deficit remains the target that you set, because predictability is very critical uh, in terms of uh, ensuring that uh, the private sector is able to uh, plan and, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, go on with their activities without any instability. So in terms of macroeconomic policy, uh, I can say predictability and consistency is there. But when you come to overall economic policy, the story is uh, slightly different. And uh, here, I can give you an example of the recent uh, issues in the mining sector that started uh, last year. Today, you have some investors who have uh, contracts, Magadi Soda, you have an, you know, the ones in Kuala, they signed investment agreements with the government, and some minister <coughs> there just comes out of the blue and says, uh, tear that piece of paper down, and I'm going to introduce new rules. Now, that can confuse the policy environment in the mining sector and completely, completely um, scare away investors. Uh, and it is happening now. Uh, if you look at the current mining bill, it has a lot of uncertainties, a lot of things that uh, it is the minister who can approve. Or sometimes we are not sure whether he would do it or not. It's, not, it's kind of open-ended. And all those uncertainties, if you read that bill, you find that the policy environment in the mining sector, if it passes away, it is, it's going to be a, a very, very bad. And uh, we have other, you know, sectors like that where uh, you saw, like, for example, the, the confusion that was at the airport, uh, with this new airport, uh, Greenfield Terminal. Mara, uh, we are going ahead. Mara, we are not going ahead. And you don't understand what's going on. Again, the, those decisions that confuse investors. Some people want to invest in that uh, uh, industry. Now, if they find the work policy environment so confusing, they will not come. And it's in uh, quite a number of areas. I'm not, I'm just giving you the negatives. There are many positives, but I'm trying to point out that our overall economic policies uh, are somewhat uh, less predictable. Uh, and this is, there is one underlying reason behind this. In many countries, any decision that has uh, impact on uh, the policy environment, decision like that can not be made unless it has the endorsement of uh, uh, the national treasury or the equivalent in those countries, especially like in America, many European countries, any decision like that before it is made, you have to get the people in the national treasury, analyze the overall impact of that uh, uh, policy. Because most of the people in ministries or sectors, they have what you might call a partial equilibrium uh, uh, approach. They're just looking at uh, 
raising um, mining royalties to raise the revenue. They are now looking at how the impact of that in other sectors, what you might call a general equilibrium uh, analysis. Uh, so uh, it is a national treasure, treasury that is sitting there looking at all these sectors. You can see what a particular decision will do across the economy. Now, uh, that doesn't happen here. You find some people um, in other sectors have the authority to raise charges or to make decisions that have major, major implications for the you know, policy environment that um, we live in. And this is something that came out of uh, especially the new constitution. I don't know how many of you followed the, the, the discussions when they were forming it. And one thing that uh, everybody wanted to do was to kill the treasury because the treasury is a bad guy. Treasury is a, you know, the most hated uh, institution because they always say no. You know, the, they call us what? The treasury what? Mandarins? <laughs> so, uh, but actually it is, um, as a, it is in the course of trying to ensure that you have predictability, you don't bust your budget, when you say no, there's no money, somebody thinks that you're just bragging there's money. Some people think that there's a tunnel between the Treasury Building and Central Bank. When you want money, you just walk there and get money and you come back. <laughs> but um, most of us have never seen any money. We just see numbers. When I tell you 800 billion, I just see it's a number to me. I don't see the money. Maybe we're where we used to see some of it, but <laughs> <laughs> you don't see it. So, uh, because of that, the powers of Treasury were watered down, and that's a very serious, uh, it has very serious implications on the, on the economy. So, uh, I can give you many examples where now, and I'm sure you, you know them, where you hear an announcement by some uh, politician, members of parliament, or uh, other government institutions, and you wonder whether these people understand what this means in terms of uh, uh, either encouraging private investment, attracting foreign investors, or, uh, and also our own investors in the countries. So it's, uh, it's an area where we need to, um, especially going forward, we need to have some um, clarity. Uh, because at the moment it's it can be as you've seen with the mining in the mining sector, it can be a very uh, dangerous thing. So now here, what I wanted uh, to do is go through some of the variables that uh, indicate us of macro uh, economic performance and see how they have performed for the last uh, ten years. Uh, but before I do that. Just one more thing. When I was outside there, we were kept on talking about uh, perception, you know, uh, corruption perception, and how we have to distinguish between perception and uh, the reality. And in this country, I was saying to my the colleagues I was with that, you know, it's a country where it's like we don't like our country. You know, there are countries where people don't like to bash their own country. We can differ internally, but when it comes to dealing with other people, we, we actually become one. America is very good at that. Uh, and, and unlike here, where you might find somebody going to a cocktail with donors and they start telling them how much corruption there is, who is corrupt, who is keeping money, we're always doing what. You know, and uh, these donors get all kinds of stories out there. Um, that convinced them that there is corruption in this country. I went to an, an embassy of one of the um, most dominant uh, countries in the world, here in Kenya, for dinner with our colleagues from other government agencies. And as we were having dinner, the ambassador told us, hey, uh, let's do this. Let's, uh, as we eat, we, we hear from different people. You tell us what is the most burning thing in your office today. So you, you know, as we eat, so we had this uh, uh, person in um, uh, governance area in, in, uh, in the government. And when it came to him, he said, the most serious thing in my docket now is corruption. I have the files. I look at it every day. I see them. Hey! I was listening to this guy, I wonder now, what, 
what are you talking about? You know, the, and to him now, that is kind of glorifying himself to this ambassador, but he doesn't know what he's doing to the country. So we are not good at that, um, and uh, it, it reinforces that uh, perception. But anyway, uh, I'm, I'm glad that uh, you um, take that perception issue. Now, one of the key indicators of uh, uh, macro performance is inflation. And you can see there that, or rather, uh, growth. The first one I have there is uh, GDP growth. Uh, you can see that up to 2007, we were doing very well. We were doing the right things, you know, in terms of economic policy management under the economic recovery strategy that started in 2003. Then come 2007, and uh, you know the silly mistake that we made, and it cost us a lot in 2008. Uh, but since then we have picked up, but since 2008 we have also faced a lot of other uh, crises which have affected uh, growth. Uh, so um, you, you can see it picked up in 2009 to almost 2.8, again 5.6 in 2010, 2011 major drought, uh, 2012 again not so good performance. Uh, I'll talk more about this when we come to results, but uh, you can see that uh, it's been fluctuating. Uh, so when it comes to results we'll talk uh, a little bit more uh, about, uh, about that. Inflation. Again, 204, that was mainly driven by drought. But other than 204, 208, and uh, 2011, inflation has been single digit, which is fairly good. Uh, 204, that was a drought. 208, again, you know why. We have, um, especially the, the post-election um, issue, and also commodity prices in 208. Remember the price of oil went up to almost 140 uh, at that time. Commodity price, uh, food and commodity prices were very expensive at that time. Um, again, 2011. Other than that, if inflation has been a single digit. And again, as I was uh, indicating to one of the questions there, the key is when you are hit with these shocks, how do you respond in terms of policy? That is what uh, uh, determines your capability in terms of uh, macroeconomic uh, policy management. Exchange rate, you can see other than 207 it's been fairly stable. 207 it, uh, it really appreciated. Uh, if you recall in 207 we issued the first major uh, IPO, Safaricom, which drew money, a lot of money. We also privatized Telcom Kenya, in addition to other inflows that were uh, beginning to come. And all those tell you, uh, show you, uh, because the shilling appreciated to around 65. Uh, since then it has stabilized around uh, 80, uh, in the recent past around 85, 86, which is fairly the right uh, point for the exchange rate. Fiscal deficit, again, largely below 5% of GDP most of the period because of the, the kind of things I was saying um, uh, in terms of um, uh, managing our budget policy. We don't encourage further borrowing unless it is absolutely necessary. We mainly deal with the uh, expenditure allocations uh, to avoid, uh, you know, getting into uh, large and sin un unsustainable deficits and also uh, you know creating instability in the market so you can see that has performed uh, fairly well uh, although uh, this is this is fiscal deficit excluding uh, uh, grants if you include grants it will be less this one is pretty high you can see uh, eight percent of GDP that's pretty high that's unsustainable but if you include the uh, grants it will get uh, lower to something like uh, five or less uh, of GDP. But I think last year, because of the pressures that we had, 
it went uh, up to almost six percent uh five point something you remember last year we had to do all kinds of things pay teachers pay um, health workers and university lecturers and unfortunately these are expenditures that are not going into productive activity and that's a major worry for us in uh, in treasury you can say um, short-term interest rates have, um, are also stable but you know they fluctuate um, over time but fairly stable uh, around um, uh, you can see here <coughs> The, in, in recent past, they are way above twelve uh, percent. But if you look at uh, if you look at the rate of inflation, the real rate is really uh, manageable. That's the lending rate. You can see we are still suffering from the effects of uh, 2011, especially after 2011, they shot up significantly. Other, other, other than that, they were fairly stable. For, most of the pre uh, past uh, since 2004. Foreign exchange reserves, they have been growing. This is a good indicator of uh, an economy that is uh, attracting uh, you know, foreign uh, inflows. I'll come back to this uh, when we discuss uh, uh, results. Uh, now here we have uh, NSE index, again an in indicator of economic activity, again um, fairly, you know, performing fairly well. This is, somebody talks, uh, talked about foreign and domestic debt, you can see the, the share of uh, foreign and domestic debt is now close to about, uh, the total debt is about, uh, about 1.6. Uh, but you can see it's almost half half. That's uh, again the same picture, again total debt. Uh, you can see it's almost actually it's above one, uh, 1 1.6 trillion. And a lot of people think this is bad that uh, debt is rising. Uh, when you look at absolute numbers like this, they can be misleading. Uh, that's why we scale them up with a, a factor like a GDP to be able to see whether it's, uh, it is getting out of control or not. So it, it's like the budget. People say, oh, we are spending 1.4 you know, trillion. That's huge, huge. Now, when the economy is growing, also expenditures go up, revenues go up. and. You know, so uh, when you look at absolute numbers, they can, uh, they can be misleading. So uh, those are some of the indicators, although I want to go back to, to, to the beginning, because I want to talk about results. That's the other thing um, that uh, I was taught to, to talk about. Uh, and the objective, of economic policy management is to grow the economy, ensure that that growth is uh, shared is across the board, and reduce poverty. That's the ultimate, reduce poverty. So now, have we done that? Have we done that? Let's look at growth itself. You can see we were growing very well up to 207. But after 2008, as I said, we have been hit by all kinds of uh, shocks. Domestic shocks, as I said, uh, silly mistakes we made in uh, 2008 were part of it. But mainly drought. And drought in Kenya is a key driver of instability because it affects the budget, it affects inflation, it affects exchange rates, and it have, yeah, those uh, are key fact, the uh, three elements. How does it do that? When you have drought, you know in, in our power is 60% uh, hydro. I think it's even more than that, I'm not sure. But if you lose that kind of power and you substitute that with uh, 
uh, diesel uh, thermal generation, which is more than twice as expensive, uh, it means two things. One, we have to subsidize the power because it's almost like 23 cents per kilowatt. So we have to, like when you hear Greco, all those emergency power generators, they are extremely expensive. So we have to subsidize that. That affects our budget because that's an unforeseen expenditure. Again, when you have no water, definitely there's no food. You have to import food. That affects our foreign reserves. It affects our budget. Uh, and because we are generating expensive power, when uh, you know uh, manufacturers use that power, they raise their prices because it's expensive. So it affects all kinds of things. It will affect inflation. It will affect uh, exchange rate because we have to import food. We have to import more fuel. Uh, so it, a drought in this country is a key destabilizer. That is why we are moving to uh, geothermal generation because it's cheap and is assured. Uh, and moving away from uh, dependence on uh, hydro generation. Um, and also things like wind. Wind is cheap and uh, it's also predictable. So the, those shocks um, have really affected us since uh, um, 2008. I think you, you, you know very well um, how many times we have had to import food. You remember Kenyans for Kenya? and other initiatives like that where even you know private people came to help uh, so that's why you saw like in uh, about a week or two ago the minister for energy the cabinet secretary outlined a plan to generate 5,000 mega of megawatts from other sources that are cheaper so that we can get uh, reduce our dependence on uh, power and uh, then uh, get that power to power growth well, but there's another story I'd like to tell you about our uh, growth numbers. Uh, for the recent past, and, and especially, you can even go back to 2007, or to even, um, say, 2005, we have not been measuring our GDP correctly. It is, in many respects, it is underestimated. And uh, one quick way to tell that is uh, I don't know how many people have been to either Uganda, Tanzania or Rwanda recently. I mean our neighboring countries. If you go there just the feel of economic activity in those countries is not like in, in Kenya. You, when you're here you can feel the dynamism of the economy wherever you go. So casually just that alone can tell you a lot about uh, whether a country like Tanzania growing at 7% and Kenya growing at 4% and the, the dynamism here you can uh, you can feel it um, it tells you something about our growth numbers now um, we know for example there has been major structural changes in the economy ICT is becoming key uh, agricultural sector has changed a lot structurally but the last survey in agricultural sector, a real survey was undertaken at a time when uh, most of you were not born, uh, more than uh, uh, about 35 years ago. That's the last time we had a real survey of the agricultural sector. So it tells you something that we are not measuring GDP correctly. Uh, and as a result of that, we tend to, to look like we are growing less than uh, other countries. And many people have told me that, you know, one time I dropped with a um, chief economist of the African Development Bank from Namanga to Nairobi, and when he crossed the border, he, he started seeing changes he had not seen the other side. You know, a lot of investments, people putting up buildings, power lines going to even uh, rural homes, the rural homes very well done, and like the other side. And when we reach close to a river, the activity even increases. It's, we are growing with culture, we are doing a lot of real estate. By the time we go to a river, he asked me, are you sure you're measuring your GDP correctly? I mean, that's what he asked, just by casual look. But we know it, and uh, we, um, we were waiting for the political season to end so that we can uh, 
um, you know, start work on it. Now we have started work on it to um, uh, in, ensure that we undertake the agricultural survey and many other adjustments in uh, the way we measure. Uh, you see, if you do it during a political year, you'll be seen to be doing it to get elected. So, but uh, for us, interestingly, we're not bothered with that. But it is a factor in um, the, uh, the, the way we measure growth. The, there's a very strong belief that it is more than what you're seeing. And that has a lot of uh, implications because GDP is one of the key macro indicators. It is the one that is used to indicate <coughs> deficit, uh, to indicate um, um, debt, the level of indebtedness, because everything is a, a percentage of GDP. So it is very important to get it uh, uh, measured correctly. Now, having said that, what about poverty? I don't have the numbers here, but uh, you know, for example, uh, up to 2007, poverty came down from uh, 5.6 to about 4.7, between 2003 and uh, uh, 2007. Since then, especially after the crisis of 2008, uh, uh, there was an indication that it was up uh, slightly, but uh, again, by 2010, it starts declining. I have some uh, preliminary numbers from uh, the World Bank showing that it could be down to about 4%, sorry, 40% uh, uh, from 47. But to be able to tell that, we need to undertake a household budget survey, which is now in the cards. We are doing that to be able to tell where we are. But even if poverty has uh, come down slightly, we have a long way to go before we can uh, really say that we have made uh, significant, pro uh, major progress in reducing poverty. But the most serious thing in Kenya is uh, inequality. Inequality levels in Kenya are very high. Uh, and I think I don't need to convince you that. So there are, I'm, I'm trying to point out that in terms of results, a consistent and sound policy management is not enough. There's more. You need to do more, uh, more than that. And in fact, the other thing I'd like to point out is that the growth that we have uh, seen has not generated employment sufficient to uh, absorb most of the uh, Kenyans who need a job. So again, that's an area that uh, uh, we are very concerned about. And I think you have had it. Uh, uh, from even the president, the Jubilee Manifesto, and everybody, all the manifestos that we saw in, in the election period, they were talking about youth unemployment, especially. So, in, in terms of results, uh, even though GDP could, could be higher, it has not made um, uh, the mark that uh, um, we would like to see. So, and that tells you a lot, as I said, in terms of oh, the distinction between managing the economy well and also ensuring that uh, you you get uh, results. You know, our deficit of the current account of balance of payments is very high, uh, or seemingly so. In fact, uh, I think two years or last year or the year before it was about 12% of GDP. That is way above what can be considered sustainable. Uh, <clears throat> because for a sustainable deficit for a country like Kenya, uh, current account deficit is something like 6%, 5 6% of GDP. So when it goes to 12%, it is a clear indication that uh, you are bright at the red light, almost, you know, on the brink. But, that 12% of GDP hides a lot of facts about uh, the structure of our balance of payments. For example, most of that current account deficit is financed, either by donors or by private investors who are bringing in equipment for drilling oil, or you know, other of mineral prospecting, people drilling. Uh, steam for geothermal generation, all that equipment is paid for either by uh, donor money or private investors who want to do that kind of work. So if 
you don't bring the money, you don't import. So it washes out. It's, uh, so to measure a current account in Kenya, you have to control for FDI and donor finance projects because it might give you a misleading number. The other thing that is very uh, obvious now, it has become obvious to us, is that uh, in the last uh, three to four years, services have changed significantly uh, in, in the balance of payments, export of services. And uh, there's a huge chunk of it that is um, classified as other services, which is kind of short-term flaws. So when you look at uh, that current account deficit of 12% uh, of GDP, and you hear the story that it is financed by short-term capital flows, so you are vulnerable to it. Um, it's not quite the case, because if you look like that category other, it is bigger, in fact, the last three years it's grown uh, phenomenally. And uh, it is because of misclassification, misclassification. There are a lot of services that are being exported. Uh, so it is not actually uh, short-term capital flows. It is uh, real services, especially in the ICT sector. I was, as I said, uh, the structure of our economy has changed uh, uh, dramatically. And uh, because of that, um, we, we again, because of that mis misclassification, we are seeing um, what we're calling, um, what, what we think is short-term capital flows, but it's actually real exports of services. So our, our current account deficit is not as vulnerable as it appears. That's the message. And then a casual look, at one way of telling that, by the way, is if the current account is 12% of GDP, why is exchange rate stable? Because, and in fact now it is appreciating, if you look now it is slightly appreciating. And you can see reserves are going up. Um, so you wonder why, why, why is it um, stable if the current account is, um, uh, you know, um, being financed in the short term capital flows. So again, this is another area in the balance of payments where we are looking at. We are going to, in fact, we have started the work to uh, disaggregate services, especially financial services, and. Um, you know, see what is actually an export of services and not just capital flows into the uh, stock exchange. So, uh, as I said, uh, in terms of results, which was the third uh, question I needed to answer, we have done okay, but we could do better. This is why we are saying that uh, as a country, we are operating below potential, we could do more. And that is what you are seeing now in the medium term plan that was launched the other day. Uh, and uh, as you may have noticed from uh, this government, it is pretty focused to actually uh, unclog all the constraints that uh, affect growth. You saw when um, the cabinet and all the other principal secretaries were appointed, the first thing the president did was to focus on the port of Mombasa to remove all the structural rigidity there because Mombasa is an asset that is being underutilized in a big way. You know, it costs more to transport goods from uh, Mombasa to Nairobi than from China to Mombasa. And it's because of lack of a railway line, it's because of the inefficiencies at the port that lead into uh, people incurring huge costs so now, if you want to reduce the cost of doing business, that's the first thing to focus on. The port, the railway line, um, they are key. And also they can lead to a lot of savings in terms of our, our roads. You know, these days if you are flying from Mombasa, you look down on Mombasa Road, it looks like one huge train. Because all these trucks are moving uh, and putting stress on our roads. So um, these are the things that we are focusing on now. Uh, to reduce the cost of doing business, to make our manufacturing sector competitive and uh, create jobs, especially in manufacturing, agribusiness, uh, and uh, ICT where we, we are doing a lot but, um, and benefiting a lot, but we could still do more. You know, one good thing about sound economic management is when things go wrong, 
you have room to borrow, you have room to adjust. Uh, that is what we did beginning in 2008, because up to that time, we had managed our debt properly. It was 65% of GDP in uh, 2002. And then we brought it down to 45, 44% around uh, 2007. So when you bring it down like that, it, now it gives you room to be able to borrow without destabilizing the economy. So when we got uh, into trouble in 2008 and going forward, we were able to do what you call a counter-cyclical policy, where you borrow uh, usually more than you are borrowing in the past. So sound, one of the virtues of sound economic management is to have that room to uh, undertake what you call a counter-cyclical policy, and that's what we do. We, we have been able to do without affecting the, the you know, the, the destabilizing the economy. But even then, as I said, with the larger deficit that we have, the the, our debt sustainability analysis still shows us that we are still okay. We are still in the green light. We are not yet at the, the red light. Now, the pension sector, the, yeah, most parastate, all the parastate was now required to go to defined contribution. Even the public sector, we have actually gotten there, but we have had challenges, um, especially all these it's, it's uh, all these pressures from um, you know teachers and doctors and all that they end up destabilizing some of the things that you wanted to do because to, to be able to move to a defined contribution there's a lot that you need you need to put a lot of chunk in there to to be able to meet the the demands but it will be uh, already now we have firmly set it up for the next fiscal year you will see it Asset bubbles will be caused by things like uh, capital flows into the country. Um, so I'm not sure that the, that relationship is, um, is uh, right. Um, but with the, or maybe I did not understand you. But with the second one, the, the, the okay, part of the, the reason why the, the stock exchange is going up is because of uh, uh, the, well, what we're calling now sound management, especially after 2011 when we corrected the, the instability that was as a result of both internal, domestic and external shocks, we, we started seeing a lot of investors coming in again uh, in, into, into the stock exchange. And uh, um, I don't think that that is uh, um, related to the real estate market but still there are questions in the real estate market that are not clear because if land in prime areas in Nairobi is what it is and people are buying uh, there are many questions and but again uh, I mentioned one thing there is a lot of inequality in this country there are very few people who can uh, uh, afford those and they are doing it very well but uh, there, there is still that question whether that is supported by fundamentals because most Kenyans cannot uh, afford uh, those um, prices. But again, one more thing. You know in Kenya we are an open economy. We have a lot of UN people here. We have uh, even ambassadors who want to live in Kenya. We have a lot of foreigners who buy houses here. We have our neighbors, they buy houses here. So the demand for uh, real estate, especially in the uh, rich areas, is a lot, um, and and that tends to keep prices above what the average Kenyan can afford. Uh, in some other countries, there is a kind of a controlled uh, participation by foreigners, but here we are very open to uh, to any anybody willing to buy a house can can buy. So they they are pushing up prices in a very uh, astronomical way. During the conference that uh, we had uh, two weeks ago, we had a session on infrastructure, and uh, it was moderated by Eddie Joroge, who was Kenyan uh, CEO. What he did was he came with a cartoon of a plane, <coughs> Jubilee plane, with the president and the, the deputy president in the plane ready for takeoff in the runway. 
on the runway. But then the, the, the runway just ahead of them, it's like the plane was here and then there's a huge crack where you, you can't take off because you just go and fall there. So he was showing, it's kind of like a mutaru, very wide, like a meter like this. So his message was simple. The infrastructure gap in this country is huge. And if you don't close it, you can't take off. You're going to stay in the runway. So in other words, infrastructure is one of the key constraints to that takeoff. The business environment is uh, another one. Uh, cost of energy is another one. So we have to deal with uh, uh, those constraints to growth. Uh, otherwise, if you don't do that, uh, you're going to be in trouble. I was late coming here and I left more than an hour ago uh, from downtown here. Uh, it takes uh, longer to drive from Nairo uh, the airport to Nairobi than to fly from Seychelles to Nairobi. So th those are the gaps that we must address. Um, the second one was on extractive industries. Okay, uh, in fact one area where there is a broad support and ownership is to ensure that our um, earnings and revenues from oil and other um, natural resources are well spent and also kept for future generations uh, as well. You, you have what you call intergenerational equity in terms of sharing those resources because they are not uh, in, uh, infinite. And uh, towards that end, we are We've been working with the experts from the World Bank, IMF, uh, African Development Bank to uh, develop a fiscal regime for extractive industries. And we are, we are almost done with it. We are, in, um, and um, we are, very soon you are going to see policy announcements uh, towards that end. Uh, but of course that's not enough. You have also to engage communities and people, especially where they uh, minerals are coming from to ensure that uh, it is also done in a way that involves um, uh, the communities. Today, um, the managing director of the IMF said that um, what is currently happening, you know now there is a lockdown, a government shutdown in the US. Uh, Obama could not go to China because they are not spending. That can have major repercussions in, uh, across the, you know, uh, the world, globally. But that to me is a short-term thing. The most important one is um, what the Federal Reserve started doing or signaling that they are going to slow down uh, what you call a quantitative easing, uh, which is basically uh, central banks, uh, the American Federal Reserve, in order to keep the money markets uh, and also create an environment where uh, the, the economy can start growing like it was doing before the crisis. They put a lot of money in the economy by buying um, a lot of uh, assets from uh, the various institutions holding them and that way, um, you know, pumping money into the economy. That's why interest rates have remained low. Uh, and uh, for us, uh, now that they are signaling that they are going to slow down, that's not good because it's interest rates are beginning to go up. That means that the price of a bond uh, or rather the, the rate you pay for the bond would be slightly higher than what would have gotten uh, last year. So uh, that is a more of concern to us than, uh, than um, the shutdown in government because that is signaling a long-term policy direction that is going in a way that uh, is not good uh, for those who want to go to the uh, money markets. Um, and, and even for some individuals, like me, you have a mortgage, you like to have a, yeah, you have to, you like to have a low interest rate, but now there's mortgage rates are also going up in the US, so um, it's going to have an effect. But nevertheless, we are going to go to the market. Uh, what we are doing now is uh, getting ready. We very soon will start uh, doing road shows, and then once we have everything ready, we just sit and wait. And until you see an opening where it's the right time to go to the market and then you go. Okay, that's it. Good, thank you very much. <laughs>